When you visit Arizona, time is measured in moments, not minutes. Like the moment you see the Grand Canyon for the first time. Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline Episode B43, Sibylline And then there shall be a flight of Romans, and thereafter there shall come the priest heard of all round, sent by the sun from Syria appearing, and by guile shall he accomplish all things. And then too the city of the sun shall offer prayer, and round about her shall the Persians dare the fearful threatenings of the Phoenicians. No, this is not my first attempt at writing epic poetry, but, you know, thanks for asking. That particular passage, heralding the arrival of Samsi Garamus on the Syrian stage, is from a source called the Sibylline Oracles, which, on the surface, sounds pretty impressive. I mean, did an ancient oracle really predict the events of the mid-3rd century? But actually, this is the other kind of oracle, the one written after the fact. Here's a fun description from historian Richard Stoneman. The 14 books of the Sibylline oracles are of widely differing date, from the early Roman Empire onwards, and reproduce in Greek hexameter verse the characteristic elusive and generalized historical despair that is found in the prophetic books of the Old Testament. So these were very different from the Sibylline books consulted by the Romans in times of crisis. The Sibylline oracles were mainly written by Jews and early Christians, often as a tool of conversion or moral instruction. But they sometimes provide an allegorical take on actual historical events. They are, in short, very odd and cryptic, but they make for some pretty fun reading. Here's the oracles on Shapur's invasion and the betrayal of Moriades. And now for thee, O wretched Syria, I weep in sorrow. For to thee shall come a dreadful blow from arrow-shooting men, which thou didst never think would come to thee. Also the fugitive of Rome shall come bearing a great spear, crossing on his way Euphrates with his many myriads, and he shall burn thee. Well, that much was true. Syria was on fire. In his famous inscription, Nakshi Rustam, Shapur uses similar wording. He also goes on to list 37 cities, in Syria and Cappadocia, sacked by the Sassanids during the year's campaign. He includes Antioch and Apamea and Arethusa, all cities along the Orontes moving south toward Emesa. But Emesa itself isn't listed. If the Persians had managed to capture Antioch, their army was clearly capable. And if they took Arethusa, just miles downriver, wealthy Emesa was their next logical step. So there's little doubt the Persian army came south. The real question is, what happened next? There is one actual detailed account by the 6th century historian John Malalas. In Book 12 of his Chronicle, he relates the following story. Shapur captured all the regions of the east as far as the city of Emesa in Phoenice Libanensis, and destroyed, burnt, and plundered it, and killed everyone. 
The priest of Aphrodite, called Samsi Garamus, came out with a force of countrymen armed with slings and went to meet him. The Persian emperor Shapur, noticing his priestly costume, ordered his army not to shoot at them nor to attack or fight them, and he received the priest as an ambassador. While the emperor Shapur was conversing with the priest, seated on a high platform, one of the countrymen hurled a stone from his sling at him and hit the emperor Shapur on the forehead. He died immediately on the spot. A disturbance broke out, and his army learned of his death. Because they supposed that the Romans had arrived, they all fled toward the frontier, pursued by the farmers and the priest Samsi Garamus, and they abandoned all their plunder and disappeared. So, yeah, okay. But there's probably at least a few good nuggets buried in all that craziness. The whole priest of Aphrodite thing may have been connected to Samsigarimus' real name of Uranius. Warwick Ball notes that the goddess Urania was equated to both the Phoenician Astarte Aphrodite and the Arabian Alot. But otherwise, the names are right, the place is right, and the surrounding events all kind of fit. And, details aside, Malalis also reports that Samsigarimus defeated Shapur. On the surface, it sounds virtually impossible, but we can try to construct a scenario. Under personal assets, Samsigarimus had his priestly title, his severin connections, and the gold from the Emocene Temple treasury. Under motive, well, self-preservation is a pretty strong motivator. There's also a good chance he was inspired by the recent revolt of Yotapian. But really, when you look at the facts, the more applicable template was Elagabalus. Back in 218, his cousin and fellow high priest had declared himself imperator, rallied local troops, and led them into battle against a much larger force. Only this time, the enemy wasn't a rival like Macrinus, but king of kings of the vast Sassanid Empire. With this glaring disparity, it's still hard to see how Samsigarimus stood a chance. But his victory becomes a bit more plausible if you introduce one final X-factor. There's zero record of any action by the Palmyrenes during Shapur's entire campaign, which, in itself, begs a few questions. For decades now, the Palmyrene army had been basically an extension of the legions. Their leader, Odonathus, was a Roman senator and chief of the Palmyrenes a role created to defend the frontier against just this type of aggression. Palmyrene colonies at Dura and Anna had been attacked by the Persian army. And yet, in the face of all these facts, the Palmyrenes decided to, what, sit this one out? Let me suggest an alternative. While it's possible they'd fought up north at the major engagement of Barbalissos, it's even more likely they came to the aid of Emesa. In fact, the Sibylline oracle I started off with is sometimes thought to describe Odonathus rather than Samsigarimus. But it seems more likely that, if he showed up, Odonathus played a supporting role. For one thing, he's never given credit for the victory. And for another, he's not the one calling himself Imperator. In the end, all speculation aside, the sources agree on one thing. Shapur never captured Emesa, or anything farther south, and soon retired with his army back to Persia. Of course, with the exception of this minor blip, the campaign was a major success. 37 Roman cities pillaged or destroyed, 
including the effective eastern capital of Antioch. And not a sign or even a word from the Emperor Aemilianus. But wait, Scott, you mean the Emperor Trebonianus Gallus, right? The guy who succeeded Trajan Decius after the Battle of Abritus? Well, no, he's already gone. And sorry for the spoiler, but I wouldn't get too attached to Aemilianus either. Returning from Abritus two years earlier, Trebonianus Gallus had been hailed as Augustus, with his son Volusian elevated to Caesar. Actually, Gallus was only co-Augustus, since the younger son of Trajan Decius was now the emperor Hostilian. Then Hostilian died of the Cyprian plague, and it was back to just Gallus and Volusian. The next two years were spent managing the plague and fending off Gothic invasions. And in 253, while Shapur invaded Syria, yet another Gothic army crossed the Danube. This time, after ravaging Thrace, they turned their attention to Anatolia. Their most infamous act was utterly destroying the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Returning to Moesia, the Goths were confronted by the local Roman governor, Aemilianus. After he somehow managed to defeat the Goths, his troops proceeded to hail him as Imperator. Gallus had Aemilianus declared an enemy of the state and marched out from Rome to put him down. But Aemilianus won that battle too and Gallus and his son Volusian were killed by their own troops. So Aemilianus was now in charge, at least as much as anyone else. But you'll pardon Samsi Garamus if he took the new regime with a grain of salt. After accomplishing his minor miracle against Shapur, he decided to do a bit of a dab. Not a triumph or anything. I mean, who was he, Mark Antony? But something designed to make a splash. What did he do? Well, he used the Emocene mint and temple gold to make coins of himself as Roman emperor. You can still find some pretty amazing examples online. I've posted my favorite on the Facebook and Twitter pages. One side shows a bust of Samsi Garamus, as coin experts say, laureate, draped, and cuirassed, with some pretty fierce lamb chops, and the legend Lucius Julius Aurelius Sulpicius Uranius Antoninus. In a major throwback, the reverse is sporting the conical black stone of Ala Gabal, drawn in a four-horse cart, flanked by parasols, and engraved with the image of an eagle. On some coins, Samsigarimus just uses his name, while on others, he calls himself Imperator and Augustus. Now, declaring yourself Imperator to rally the troops is risky, but maybe forgivable. But raising the bar to Augustus is a whole different animal. Samsigarimus probably had zero intention of trying to conquer the Roman Empire, but he certainly appeared completely indifferent to the quote-unquote authorities back in Rome. Unlike Yotapian, there's no information on how far Samsigarimus extended his rule. In fact, all we know for sure is he controlled the Emocene Mint. But even that was provocative, and the real question was, what would the Emperor Valerian do? What's that? What about the Emperor Aemilianus? Oh, yeah, sorry, but he's already dead. Stop me if you've heard this before, but a provincial governor marched on Rome, and the Emperor went out to fight him before being killed by his own troops. Yep, you are correct. That's exactly how Aemilianus had come to power. Aemilianus's imperial career was helpfully summarized by the 4th century historian Eutropius. 
Aemilianus came from an extremely insignificant family, his reign was even more insignificant, and he was slain in the third month. Ouch, Eutropius, too soon. This time, the governor who took the throne was Publius Licinius Valerianus. And apart from the whole usurpation thing, Valerian was a fairly traditional Roman emperor. Etrurian roots, senatorial family, former consul and provincial governor. As Gibbon puts it, his noble birth, his mild but unblemished manner, his learning, prudence, and experience were revered by the Senate and people. And if mankind had been left at liberty to choose a master, their choice would most assuredly have fallen on Valerian. So let's stop the musical chairs for a bit and give the new guy a shot. Valerian took power in 253 at the age of 58. He elevated his 40-year-old son, Gallienus, to co-Augustus, and his teenaged grandson, Valerian II, to Caesar. Taking a look at the empire they jointly ruled, they couldn't have much liked what they saw. Invasions, plagues, usurpations, and a crap economy all made for a pretty long to-do list. The decision was made for Valerian to head east, while his son Gallienus dealt with the west. There were a few good reasons Valerian thought the east was the bigger concern. For one, the last Roman emperor they'd seen was Philip the Arab ten years earlier. For another, Shapur's campaign and the sacking of Antioch had severely eroded Roman authority. And lastly, there was a local usurper named Samsi Garamus who claimed he was related to the Severans. Though it seems like much longer, the Severans had been out of power for less than two decades. Valerian himself had been born under Septimius Severus and lived his first 40 years under Severan rule. For a new usurper on a shaky throne, the threat may have felt pretty real. Even so, it took more than a year for Valerian to make it out east. In 255, he arrived at Antioch, or at least, you know, the pile of rubble where Antioch used to be. Actually, I'm sure it wasn't quite that bad, but he did order the city's reconstruction. And he'd barely arrived when a Gothic invasion forced him to march right back west. But before he did, one way or the other, Valerian dealt with Samsi Garamus. Whatever his reasons, it seems Samsi Garamus had seriously misplayed his hand. The way things were going, he may have expected that no one would bother to challenge him. But the moment an actual emperor came east, local officials, the legions, even the Palmyrenes, all snapped right back into line. It's possible Samsi Garamus was allowed to retire, maybe even keep his high priesthood. If he had successfully defended Emesa, he'd be a pretty popular figure. But... On the flip side, that same popularity made him all the more dangerous to keep around. Though we don't know for sure, it seems pretty likely that Valerian took a more direct approach and had Samsi Garamus arrested, tried, and executed for treason. Valerian and Gallienus spent 256 fighting Goths in Anatolia and Germans on the Rhine which, unfortunately, allowed for one more eastern tragedy. Sometime that year, the ancient city of Dura Europos was targeted and besieged by the Persians. The siege was typical in most respects, but had one interesting element. The Sassanids were tunneling under the walls, and the Durans were tunneling to stop them. When the defenders burst into a Persian tunnel, the Sassanids lit a mixture of sulfur and pitch. 
the resulting cloud of sulfur dioxide instantly killed 20 men. Their bodies were found still lying in the tunnel when it was excavated in 1933. The defenders, either Roman or Palmyrene, had been killed by an early chemical weapon. Regardless of the ins and outs, Dura was captured and destroyed. Again, the Persians didn't raise it to the ground. You can still see pictures online. But, like Hatra, it was damaged, depopulated, and abandoned to the desert, and would never again be inhabited. The following year, 257, Valerian returned to the east. Though now 62, and perpetually compelled to fight major fires, his intentions remained unchanged. Rebuild eastern cities, eastern defenses, and eastern confidence in Roman rule. His initial priority was rebuilding Antioch, and that work had already begun. His eventual goal was to gather an army and take to the field against Shapur. But in the meantime, he needed to do what he could to strengthen Rome's regional allies. And the one most conspicuously singled out was the chief of the Palmyrenes, Odenathus. At the time, Odenathus was 37 and had already served a dozen years as both Ras Tadmor and Roman senator. Given his role as defender of the East, it's pretty surprising he didn't take more heat for Shapur's recent invasion. In the absence of details, we can only speculate. Maybe the Persian force had just been too overwhelming, or, as I mentioned, maybe the Palmyrenes had played some part in the successful defense of Emesa. Either way, Odenathus clearly had Rome's full backing and confidence. And in 257, Valerian named him Clarissimus Consularis, denoting a senator who'd been elected Roman consul. At the same time, he was apparently elevated to governor of Syria Phoenice, the province created by Septimius Severus back in 194. It held the cities of Tyre, Emesa, Palmyra, and Raphanea, home to the apparently reconstituted Third Gallic Legion. The dual Roman honors made Odenathus the most powerful man in the East, with the obvious exception of Valerian himself. And, possibly in celebration, Odenathus decided to marry his second wife. There's little record of his first wife, other than she'd borne him a son and sometime later died. The now six-year-old boy was named Hieron, after Odenathus' father, and was known in Greek as Herodian. Odenathus' new wife was 17, making her 20 years his junior, or a few years closer in age than Septimius Severus and Julia Domna. As Gibbon notes, she was of a dark complexion. Her teeth were of a pearly whiteness, and her large black eyes sparkled with uncommon fire, tempered by the most attractive sweetness. Her voice was strong and harmonious. Her manly understanding... Yeah, sorry ladies, that's Gibbon, not me. Her manly understanding was strengthened and adorned by study. She was not ignorant of the Latin tongue, but possessed, in equal perfection, the Greek, the Syriac, and the Egyptian languages. Her parents had named her Bat Zabai, or Daughter of Zabai, where Zabai is Palmyrene for of the beautiful long hair. But in Greek, she was called Zenobia. Like Odenathus, Zenobia likely hailed from a major tribe or a powerful merchant family, and there are at least two strong contenders for her father. Al-Tabari claims her father was chief of the Omliki, and had died in a war against their great rivals, the Tanuk. Another candidate, 
based on his name, was Julius Aurelius Zenobius Zabdilla. The strategos who'd governed Palmyra during Severus Alexander's campaign. But back beyond that, there's not much to go on, apart from her own later claims. The most famous, of course, was her alleged descent from Cleopatra and Julia Domna. But unfortunately, as I discovered a while back, there's just no way to make that connection. She also called herself Daughter of Antiochus, which may be a reference to Antiochus IV, the Seleucid king of Syria 400 years earlier. That Antiochus did marry a Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic princess Cleopatra Thea. But again, there's just a slew of intervening generations with absolutely no documentation. Either way, on her marriage to Odenathus, she took the name Septimia Zenobia. And, just like Severus and Julia Domna, very little time had passed before Zenobia learned she was pregnant. The following year, she gave birth to a son, who was named Vabalathus, or Gift of a Lot. Like his seven-year-old half-brother Hieron, he also had a Greek version, Athenodorus. While the Persian frontier stayed deceptively quiet, the West was embroiled in constant war. Valerian's son and co-emperor Gallienus was proclaimed Germanicus Maximus no less than five times between 255 and 258, as well as Dacius Maximus in 257. His own son, the teenaged Valerian II died along the Danube in 258. On hearing the news, the Emperor Valerian replaced him as Caesar with Gallienus's younger son, 16-year-old Saloninus. By 259, Antioch and Syria were finally recovering from Shapur's devastation. According to historian Benjamin Isaac, Valerian had also fortified the defenses of several Arabian cities, including Bostra, Dionysius, and Ardra. With the preliminaries dealt with, the emperor decided it was time to execute his endgame, assemble an army, cross the Euphrates, and finally deal with the Persians. Now, Valerian was no spring chicken, he was 64 years old. If he did go east, he'd be the oldest Roman emperor to ever do so. Apart from that, the recent track record wasn't very encouraging. Severus Alexander had been fought to a standstill, and Gordian III had been killed. Much to Valerian's credit, or otherwise, neither fact altered his plan. In the spring of 260, Valerian got word that Shapur had launched a fresh campaign. He'd crossed Mesopotamia, entered Osrowini, and was besieging Karai and Edessa. The cities were only a virtual stone's throw from Valerian's headquarters in Antioch. And once they'd been captured, it'd be right back to Syria to reverse all his hard-won gains. Even in retrospect, it's hard to see how Valerian had any choice. Without delay, he gathered Roman forces and marched them east toward Edessa. Mm -hmm. 